Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, after Monday's video report, I had several of you email me asking about where you can go to get access to sea surface temperature maps. So I'm going to make sure that you have access to both of these maps I'm about to share with you today, uh, just so you can kind of keep an eye on the ocean temperature patterns like we discussed in Monday's video. So this is actually our latest map uh, available to us here, and I'll put the link to this right down in the description below here. Where I get all these from is from this website right here. It's from NOAA. And they've got lots of different ways by which you can look at time series of these data, animations of these data, and even reconstruct historical maps of them. So it's a really great resource for you to be able uh, to start using and do that. Now, I also want to talk about droughts. Uh, many people have sent me this image lately, uh, and it's just looking at every drought monitor uh, going back until the year 2000. So it's, it's a great resource just to kind of check out here. And uh, it's kind of March, April, you know, all the way through uh, September. So it's a growing season drought monitor. And I just want to let you know that if you go to the drought monitor website, of course, we have a new drought monitor today, you can do all of this as well. So again, just Google US drought monitor and you'll find this. And if you come over here to the maps, you can do a map archive and go look at historical drought data. What I want to point out today is that in the newest drought monitor, we saw um, some changes. There's been improvement in the drought in parts of the south and southeast. Uh, we've seen better precipitation moving through parts of, of the Midwest, but really we still have about two-thirds of the country in some form of drought, uh, and that includes the vast majority of the western part of the United States. So what we're going to focus on in this video is could things possibly be changing in April across the West? What do we need to be looking out for in the longer run? And what's going on with La Nina to kind of uh, influence all of this? Because certainly the issues we're seeing with drought are being pushed forward by the fact there is still a, a relatively strong La Nina. We'll come back to that in just a few seconds. I like to show these graphics. They just kind of provide a lot of context. So since the start of this year, uh, we've seen a few areas that have just been exceptionally dry. And on the flip side of that, some areas that have been exceptionally wet. On the wet side, it's been a lot in the Mid-South into New England. It's been part of the North interior of the United States. While so many systems continue to put um, drier conditions in this area, like the most recent one that ejected into the Northern Plains, leaving just a large dry slot is what we call that on the back side that just completely missed parts of Nebraska and South Dakota with precipitation. And, and earlier, we, we thought, due to the farther uh, south progression in the models earlier, that this area is going to get hit. But then it turns out the system ejected too far to the north and, as a result, just eliminated that chance. We've been dry throughout Texas. We've seen numerous, of course, reports of these massive dust storm events. And we've seen uh, how dry things are in there. But of course, in the West, California having its dry start to any year. And that, that bleeds over into parts of Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and Southern Oregon. But that's an area, Southern Oregon into Northern California, that I think is going to be seeing quite a bit of change coming very soon. So we build this story out by looking at soil moisture. I will be very anxious to see how this map changes in the next couple of days or a couple of weeks right into this area because as we've all been well aware, there's been a massive blizzard that's hit that particular area. And some of the snow that's gone down here has been extremely heavy and some of the drifts are over five or six feet. I've actually seen some that go up under the roofs of houses. So the winds have really pushed the snow around. The issue has been we've not been able to really beat back the drought that's been in the western and central plains. While just to the east of there, we would love to give some of this water away. It's just been so incredibly wet in places here. So this just gives us perspective where we are in mid-April with our soil moisture. Now, the severe weather we've seen over parts of the Mid-South, the South, and the Southeast has right now got us kind of on a breakneck pace with the accumulation of these severe weather reports. So today, excuse me, this week has been no exception. So where we currently sit here on tornado counts is, um, you know, we're at 488 normal would be, or average, I should say, would be uh, 309. So this is uh, being a very, very active March and April time period. And I'll give evidence here in a few moments. I don't expect this to slow down anytime soon. On the hail reports, lately, this week, some of the storms have been producing some extremely large hail. And you've seen that throughout the south and mid-south and southeast. So we're starting to really bump up down here. But our severe wind reports, given the, 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 the storm system that went through parts of the mid-south yesterday, uh, are now uh, bumped up substantially. And by the way, there's a great project right now from the University of Illinois and other universities uh, called Perils, which is down there studying those embedded uh, circulations, the tornadoes in those squall lines to study them and understand them so we can forecast them better. So it's a fascinating project. I'm excited that, that, that we're doing this. But as I said, if we come back to that soil moisture map, I'm going to be watching right here carefully. 
And that's because when we look at, in fact, let's look at this map first. Yeah, over the last 72 hours, we have seen some places here pick up in excess of 30 inches of snow. And the little map I jumped over there shows you how much water's in that. So let's blow this up. In other words, if you melt it all down, what do you end up getting? So this part of the Missouri River Basin, as we've talked about so much this winter, missed out on snow. It was just, you know, at about half of normal. Well, this system came through, and even though it's April, it put in, you can see down here in the color bar, an inch to two inches of liquid. Now, when you melt that out, remember, the frozen soil doesn't take it in very easily. A lot of it will run off, uh, but it's moisture. It's moisture that's going to be in place. And so, yeah, it's a blizzard, but I'm glad that the moisture got into this particular area. And now we can see just how much uh, got into that area. Okay, when we come out west, though, I just want to show you some of the latest updates from the uh, regional snowpack from the automated snow sensors out there. So we start in the northern Sierra. We're at about 18% of normal. And as you come down the mountains, you know, we're up right around 25 to 30% of normal. This is going to change. And what's going to prompt this change is that we've seen as of late, looking at some satellite imagery here, moisture has been able to come almost directly out of the west. See it right here? and target California. That's just looking at a recent satellite animation. You can see as this goes through, look at the massive winter storm that was here. Really, it's a spring storm system. And there's all the severe weather we saw yesterday in the Mid-South, uh, over 300 reports of severe weather in the South yesterday. But what I'm going to be concerned about is where all of this is going. Because as, as we've been discussing, the momentum in the Pacific jet stream right now is high. And even through Easter weekend and into next week, this is what it's going to look like on the 18th. We continue to see nearly zonal flow. That's west to east flow coming off of Asia, hitting Japan, and then coming across the Pacific. There's no major block in this flow. In fact, it's dipping into a trough right here. Sorry, let's let that reset uh, in this part of, of the Gulf of Alaska and just off the west coast. So more is coming. We need to see how much of this is going to make up for some longer term deficits that we've been dealing with. So when you put together the next 10 days, no, this was not well forecast weeks ago. The long range didn't pick up on this, but now we get closer and we can see that there is, I mean, this is really good chance of seeing um, uh, much above average precipitation in this area. So I like it for the longer term water health of the West. In the near term, it's quite disruptive. Now, if you're looking at this map, we're going to talk in a few moments about how you see a pretty large region into here that's looking drier than normal over the next 10 days. Don't think that you're going to have a wide open you know, window of opportunity to get field work done. There are systems rolling through. They're going to be, the, it's the timing of them that's going to chase us out of the fields, not the total amount. And this map represents total amount. But also, if you come down back to the Mid-South, there's going to be a lingering frontal boundary, plus a system that picks up more moisture on this coming through the Midwest, dragging a front through the Mid-South. And that's why we see more precipitation there. I'll give you some details on that in just a second. I made a map this afternoon I'm going to share with you. It goes back to the uh, end of March, March 22nd through April 12th, so a couple of days ago. And it just shows you the issues we've been dealing with. And what it is here is there's a number and there's color coding, but look at the numbers. That tells you the number of times where there was rain or precipitation on any day from uh, March 22nd uh, through April 12th. So, you know, we're basically looking here over, um, you know, a little bit more than a three week time period. So in those 21, 22 days, we have some places throughout the Midwest and New England that have had more than a third to a half of those days with precipitation. So we've really not been able to get a lot done here because of uh, the, the wet weather. Come back to the plains, it's been extremely dry. We've just had very few precipitation events. And the numbers over here in California and Oregon are going to be changing. Uh, but uh, we've seen here very, very few um, late March and April precipitation events. Now, in the Midwest and down in the South, when it has been stretches of drier weather, we've often seen them accompanied with colder conditions. So when you go back to March 22nd, look up to today, this is now a map showing you average temperature conditions. So what I'm trying to do here is understand how spring has allowed us to uh, get going with our spring field work, planting, what's going on with the winter wheat crop, the moisture situation in the West. And we're just kind of building that picture out so we can see where we're going to go from here. All right. Now, over the next five days, after this current system is still curling up in Ontario today, we're going to be seeing quite a bit of colder air. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So through Easter weekend, getting into early next week, just really pushing through uh, the Midwest down into parts of the, the Mid-South and Southeast. 
So this is going to be another situation where it's now the temperatures keeping us away from doing the kind of work that we want to get done. Because just looking at soil temperatures, this is a forecast of course, but see this black contour? That's where we expect on Easter morning the 50 degree isotherm to be. So it's really far to the south, which means soil temperatures north of that are still they're still too cold to really get a lot done. And of course we have snow sitting on the ground pretty far to the north. So given that as a setup, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look now what we expect to see through the rest of April and into the month of May. And that discussion comes back to where we began with this La Nina. We continue to see strong trade winds here. And those stronger trade winds are just, just they're a sign that the atmosphere is still behaving very much like a La Nina. So we also have other evidence of this. Uh, one of our favorite indexes for La Nina is the Southern Oscillation Index. It's a pressure difference between Tahiti in the middle of the Pacific and Darwin in Northern Australia. And generally speaking for this index, if it's above a value of seven, then we're looking at base La Nina state behavior in the atmosphere. So it's been way up here in March. It kind of tried to dip at the beginning of April, but not back down below seven. And now it's come all the way back up to a value of 14. So what we would use this information to say is that the atmosphere is behaving in a La Nina base state. And historically, if we look at what the temperatures could do based upon that, we tend to get a lot of cold air that comes in here at times, moves through the north interior of the US and then blasts east. We tend to stay warmer down in the southern plains and that's also a place where we tend to stay drier. So when we look right now, our other key indicator that La Nina is still quite present is in the, the, the trade winds. And as I've talked about for all of winter, when you just see this column of blues sitting right here in the Pacific Ocean, that just tells you that the trade winds are strong and are expected to be strong with time. That's another sign of La Nina. Now La Nina this winter and spring has really controlled the position and movement of the MJO, preventing it from coming out over here into phases seven and eight. It keeps restarting it back into the Indian Ocean. And the thing we're seeing now is that's gonna happen again. So instead of like we saw in the forecast, the MGO popping out like this, it's now currently sitting in null space and it's gonna curl around, reset over by Africa, and then sweep back through these phases yet again. Now, what do we do with that? Well, if that's recently just happened, we might ask, is that what's gonna happen again with respect to the forecast? So I now show you the last 30 days of precipitation anomalies. And generally speaking, it was it was drier most of that time period in California, drier throughout the West, really, you know, brutally dry through parts of the central and high plains and, and western plains. And then all the action was here with the severe weather. It was coming through the Midwest, soaking things. It's hitting the Great Lakes. There was a drier pocket in parts of Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia, but it wasn't as though we didn't have systems come through there. So what I'm telling you is if we go back to where we just were, do you see this line here? That was the history. If it comes back into this area, it should be no surprise that the new long range models for the month of May look something similar. Now, where do I think they're gonna be off? I think that we could return better moisture, I think farther back to the west, here. Not on the other side of this, but here. The PDO being negative just tells me that this area, that's the cold water in the Gulf of Alaska, by the way, is gonna struggle. Without a strong subtropical component to the jet, we're going to struggle. So the moisture coming in the next 10 days here is going to be critical because as we go all the way out to the end of May, excuse me, we don't see the revival of that. Good news with this forecast is the return of moisture toward the Canadian Prairie, where we've seen it lately, the Northern Plains. But our message of tight windows east just continues to show up again and again in the forecast models. So that's the picture that we continue to paint, and that's the one we're going to be watching just, you know, very carefully over the coming weeks and, and now months. So latest update here. Now in the near term, we've got some really interesting things going on. First is today's wind field. All right, there's that deep low that's curled up here. Uh, it took three days uh, to go from Wyoming uh, to, to Ontario. And this is producing some incredibly strong winds uh, right here in parts of the Midwest, the upper Midwest. Uh, into, and back into parts of the Northern Plains. Uh, storms are out ahead of it. You can see here, we just kind of zoom in on some of the active storms moving through parts of Virginia and Maryland, and then here into New Jersey, cutting through parts of New York and whatnot. Uh, these storms are, are moving out relatively quickly, and uh, we've been keeping an eye on them all day today. So our all hazards weather map, it's got all the wind advisories here. There's still a ground blizzard in effect, and, and also there's still more snow falling here in parts of North Dakota. And then you've got this large area that once again is under um, 
risk of fire. That's all a red flag warning. But take a look right here. The blue is indicating the colder weather and the risk of more snow. And I'm going to come back to that in just a few seconds. So what's going on right now with our uh, radar? Well, we see that throughout the afternoon, here's the storms moving through parts of New England. And there's the snow still curling around the backside of this. But look at the action in the west. That's what we've got to spend some time talking about today. So we're going to start first with the high-res NAM model, the 18Z run. And let's just play this through Thursday night, getting out into Friday morning. Now, what I'm expecting to see throughout the day on Friday is there is a weak front stretched in through here, such that early in the morning through middle of the day, there could be some scattered precipitation on that front into Friday evening. Now, in terms of severe weather, we're expecting the possibility for storms coming through parts of Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, this area. But as of right now, the indication of those being severe is limited, but more precipitation along this band, which is associated with that blizzard we've been dealing with for the last few days. Now, throughout the day on Friday, getting into Saturday, those storms kind of sag south, and we get here into Saturday and Sunday, and there's just more rain coming in for parts of the Mid-South. But let's go back and watch the West. You see another push of moisture is coming in uh, to, to tomorrow night into Saturday morning into Oregon, into Northern California. And there's even more that's following that. And that system is going to try to emerge on Easter Sunday somewhere here in the Northern Plains. And I'm going to come back to that in just a few moments, but there's something I want to put in the back of your mind to be watching before I transition into the longer range. I started picking up at this on Monday, but I didn't want to share it yet on Monday because it was a bit uncertain. But the thing we've been watching is this typhoon. And yes, it is early uh, to be talking about tropical systems like this, but the Western Hemisphere, excuse me, the Western um, Pacific can produce them at any time of year. But that typhoon, uh, we saw some earlier forecast guidance going back to earlier this week and weekend that what's left of it could get pulled into the Pacific jet. Now, the current forecast is suggesting that what's left of that does exactly that, gets pulled over the Aleutian Islands, which means we have to watch to see how the, the, the recurvature, that's what we often call this, the recurving to the north of this tropical cyclone could influence weather 10 plus days from now in the United States. So with all of that put together, let's go see how this all happens. Heights first. Now, I know you're going to be tempted to look here, but I want to get your attention somewhere else. Do you see Japan over here in the corner? That typhoon is just off my map right here. Okay, now watch. As we play through, you're going to see it. There it is. It's going to interact with a short wave in the flow coming off of China, hitting Japan, and they're going to meet together right there and become this feature. That then gets absorbed into the high momentum flow of the jet stream that we've been talking about in the Pacific. And watch, you keep your eye on this guy right here. It then gets tossed around the backside of this trough, which is going into the Northwest next Tuesday. This is what was once that typhoon. Now, as that then digs down into the West, this is next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It appears that on the 23rd and 24th, it emerges as a trough in the four corner states and you notice the ridge out ahead of it, that's gonna signify a warm-up, that's gonna signify a return of moisture, and then this is gonna kick through it, disrupting the flow of the atmosphere and producing what could be another large spring storm system. Now, with all of that, let's go take a look and analyze it. We do that with our two model analysis here, GFS on the left, European on the right. Now, we've already talked about what's happening Thursday, getting into Friday, and into early Saturday. Okay, so that's already been covered by the high-res models. What I told you to watch out for was that on Easter Sunday, you see right here there's a weak low that came off of that system that hit California first that's going to merge probably somewhere between South Dakota and Montana. And then that low starts to move across the country. Take a look at it over here in the European. So more snow for Montana, or, uh, excuse me, uh, for uh, North Dakota and the Red River Valley of the North. There'll be a front to the south of it. And it's actually going to intersect with the lingering frontal boundary that's been sitting down here, hence all the wetness in this area. And then that pushes east. It deepens over the Great Lakes on Monday afternoon and then really just pulls into New England once we get into Tuesday. Large area of high pressure comes in behind it, and that's going to be the, the coldest extent of air after Easter. But now we're watching the west again, and here comes the next punch from that high momentum jet. It sends one lead wave out on Wednesday. It sweeps its front right through the midsection of the United States. So I told you there's lots of chances of rain in through here, just not the really heavy stuff. And that comes sweeping through, see it? 
and here comes the next wave out in the West. And that's the one that I'm going to watch most carefully. That's Friday the 24th, or excuse me, the 22nd. And as that wave emerges, it's that classic setup with the high pressure over the southeast. So the flow comes around it. This returns the moisture. The wave came in, ejected here in the northern plains. It's going to leave a long dry line in through this area. We're just going to have to watch out. And right now, the timing is next Sunday, next Saturday into Sunday, for the risk of strong to severe storms and more moisture here. This is what this high momentum jet is affording us. And for many, it's a major benefit given the moisture issues that we've been seeing. So we put all this together and we say, what's the likelihood? The European Ensemble has been on top of this for a while. Looking out there at next Saturday night, you can see that there's a clustering of where the different ensemble members are putting that low. We need to keep an eye out if it is going to inject here in the central plains or if it might be farther to the south. Those kind of things are unknown. The thing we need to understand though is that as it does come out, it is going to first hit the west, watch, bring in an extra precip, and then as it ejects out here into week two, that's going to open up for another round of precipitation. Now here's the unknown. How far to the west does it make it? Every other system has left this area high and dry, and we've seen just massive dust storms out of it and fire risk. We need to assess later if this system truly is a four corners trough to then draw in enough moisture to start to change that precipitation pattern. I will be watching this for the next 10 days. That's going to be a major focus of mine. Remember though, it's all right now living here. So we've got several pieces to watch move forward. Okay, uh, precipitation out west. Because of this high momentum jet pushing into the west, the chances over the next 15 days of grabbing an inch of liquid is shown here. So that's fantastic. What about two inches? Still very high in Northern California, through coastal Oregon, into coastal Washington. Chances of four inches we might be really reviving what has been just absolutely decimated this year with respect to just not having that precipitation. So this is late, but it's moisture. And that's why we talked about California at the beginning of this. All right, let's talk temperatures, South America, and then we'll be done. Over the next seven days, uh, we're going to be seeing our frost line getting pretty far to the south here. But um, I still think the potential is even greater farther to the south of what you see here as we look out into early next week. Now the high temperatures, when we compare them to normal, which is what the color shading is, this was today on Thursday. There's Friday, getting into Saturday and Sunday. So Saturday here and then Sunday. So Easter Sunday for many uh, in the northern plains of Canadian Prairie through the Midwest and New England is, is going to be quite cold. Warm south, warm in the southwest compared to normal. Well there's Monday. Tuesday. Now that's a day I'm going to be watching to see how far to the south we do get those frosty temperatures. But as after that, we're going to see the atmosphere really starting to do a bit of a, a rebound. And I'm going to show you that by looking at going out there to the next weekend. So day five through 10. This is going to be the warm up ahead of that deep trough that is right now the typhoon that's going to be coming through. So you can see throughout much of the end of next week, we're dealing with much below average temperatures here, which again is kind of stunting this early season. But as we go from day five through 10, Pressing toward the end of April and even the beginning of May, which is right here at the very end, there is a pretty big warm-up coming. Once we get into May, especially after the first week of May, it's hard to bring really, really cold air far south. And the question is, without a highly amplified jet stream, is it possible to do that? So I'll be watching for that last frost date and keeping you posted on it, okay? From there, let's talk South America very quickly as we finish this up. When we look right now at the drought severity index over the last month, so this goes from March 11th to um, April 10th, we've seen much of like Bahia, Minas Gerais, Goiás, Tocantins, and pockets of Mato Grosso showing up dry. And this has impacted some of the safrina crop. When we look out there over the next um, 10 days, or 15 days, excuse me, there's better moisture trying to come into eastern Brazil, but overall we continue to see a drier signal. There's a weak stalled out boundary that's going to be here, but south of that things are going to be dry. Now this is good for southern Brazil, which has been extremely wet as of late. So the precipitation pattern in southern Brazil went from record drought to very wet and now back over to dry again. So we're almost at the end of the monsoon as we talked about on Monday. And therefore, we need to see how the safrina crop finishes. It's certainly not going to be getting an abundant amount of moisture going forward as they start to approach the greenfield time period. 
So we'll keep you updated on that, and I'll report to you again on Monday. Have a good rest of your week and weekend, and we'll talk then. Thank you.